visiting passes. We invite you to fill out the blue card that's in the seat pocket in front of you. We'll be collecting these cards a little later in this week. We know that coming to a new place isn't easy, and we'd love to send you a gift in the coming week. If today is your second time joining us, and you already filled out the card, all you have to do is put your name and email address on the back. We have three different services here on Sunday mornings. One at 7.50, 9.15, and 10.45. Our 7.50 service has lower volume and standard house lighting. There's also a traditional service that meets at 10.45 in the Barrier Chapel. Our hope is that you find a time and a place to experience God in a meaningful way. One of the ways you can keep up with everything happening here in Costas is to connect with us online. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or download our free mobile app from the Android, Apple, and Windows app stores. You can also subscribe to our weekly email newsletter by clicking the link at the bottom of the page at CasasChurch.org. You've got to practice, you know, the basics and the fundamentals of kickball first. Then you can work out some some stuff that's a little bit, you know, a little bit more street. It doesn't feel good to get hit in the face by a kickball. You're not supposed to. It shouldn't happen, but it does happen. And so it's important to protect your, your eyes from, from that kind of impact. The great thing about uh, Casas is we came in, we'd only been here seven months, we were looking for a new church, um, and we walked through the doors and immediately we felt at home. We didn't know what the next step was going to be, and uh, we were fortunate enough to see that there was a uh, sign that said connect room, and we heard the senior pastor of Land talk about the 10 minute party. It was just a really neat feeling just to know that everyone wanted to meet us. They were excited to meet us too. You know, we wanted to get plugged in, we did. We started serving, and really we did all kinds of things. Uh, at first, just to kind of figure out and get used to Casas as our home church. And we kind of found our spot in the 10 minute party. So it makes it really easy because we walked through those same doors. We were brand new, we didn't know anybody. A little nervous about going to the 10 minute party, but, you know, we got the nerve to do it. And uh, we're just glad that we got connected and we're here and we're able to serve that way. And come hang with us. It really is a 10 minute party. You get to find out more about our church and uh, you get free baked goods. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you also get a free water bottle. Nice. Look at this. And you get to hang out with us. celebrate some worship together.
seated. We're going to take some time to uh, walk through communion as a community of believers here this morning. And it's this beautiful time. And of course, it goes back to that moment where Jesus was with his disciples. And he was taking this long, long tradition of the Passover meal, just filled with inner imagery and beauty, and does something new with it. He turns it into this new tradition that he asks his followers to follow. And so in the next few moments, uh, we're going to take the communion elements. And the way we do this here, you'll notice that there are communion tables uh, that are set up all throughout uh, the room on the floor here. And I'm going to ask you in a moment to just uh, move towards those tables and to get the elements, but don't take them yet. Uh, just bring them back to your seat and we will take them together. And just because this is such a uh, community-oriented thing that we walk through, maybe if there's someone around you that you know would uh, maybe struggle or find it difficult to be able to uh, get up and make their way to get the elements, maybe you could just offer to get those elements for them, just as an act of love and kindness here this morning. So, as the worship team uh, leads out to just kind of set the mood here at this point, why don't you uh, go ahead and get up and begin moving toward uh, the tables.
at this table with his disciples. And he gives them and us and all who follow him, us as the followers of Christ, this beautiful imagery of Christ and what he did for us. He took the bread and he broke it. And of course, it becomes symbolic of his body. And it's this incredible act of love that, that he gives his body as an act of love for us. And I love what scripture speaks of it says that we love Christ, but we love him because he first loved us. He freely gave his body for us as an act of love. So he took the bread, he broke it, and he said, take it. Next, he took the cup, and of course, what was contained in the cup, that wine, Jesus used symbolically of his blood, that his blood would be shed, and it would be through the shedding of his blood that our sins would be forgiven, this beautiful picture. But isn't it interesting how Jesus chooses to explain the forgiveness of our sins? Because it comes as a cup that contains his blood. It comes, he says this, as a new covenant, what he offers us through the forgiveness of our sins isn't just the forgiveness of our sins. It is the forgiveness of our sins that ushers us into this new covenant, into a relationship with him. And with that, we now have a new family. We belong to the family of God. We, we belong to one another in this, in this most beautiful family all through the shedding of his blood and the forgiveness of our sins. So he took the cup and he said, take and drink. Would you worship with us this morning? Just sing this up. When I heard that Casas Church was doing a kickball tournament, I felt like I had been a fish flopping around um, out of the water for years, and somebody just picked me up and put me back into the water. And I could breathe through my gills again. I started playing kickball when I was three. There was a lot of animosity from other three-year-olds that couldn't be the type of kickball player that I was, but I was 
the best probably in the world at kickball. You know, I was a little bit of an outsider growing up. People would want to go, you know, hey, let's go to the movies or let's go to some, you know, the mall. <clears throat> the mall. And I was like, no, I'm playing kickball. I would go just go hard all the time on kickball. Like it was 190%, 200%. <laughs> it was August 12th, 2003. And something happened that I, I, I slipped or something, I felt something give. I'm pretty sure what happened was that I snapped my hip flexor. Do I have two hip flexors? I do have two? Oh, I don't know if it's like a spleen, because you only have one spleen, right? <laughs> you know, it's just like emotionally, it's, it's, um, it's just getting to me a little bit. Uh, the doctors told me that my hip flexors were inoperable. Which is a tough thing to hear, for sure, because, I mean, who, who says that? <laughs> Casas Church is doing a kickball tournament. Um, I mean, the day that I found that out was like 12 Christmases at the same time. And it was like somebody said, like, hey, here's your life again, almost. Not all totally, but a little bit, because, I mean, you know, there's other things in life. You know, I'm like, you're still fit perfectly, so... It was like I just kind of picked up where I left off. Could you get that out, please? <laughs> so kickball, you ready for kickball? Yeah, yeah, and you're probably thinking, why kickball, okay? Uh, when you came in, uh, you uh, probably received one of these uh, cards that talks a little bit about uh, kickball around here, and you're probably still saying, seriously, why kickball? We, we, we're we're, we're going to do a kickball term. We are. It's going to be exciting. Um, and I know some of you love kickball. It's okay to admit it. Maybe not here in this group, but you love kickball. Um, the reason we're doing uh, this kickball tournament is to raise awareness for what we're doing in our Kids for Kids uh, program to uh, try and collect shoes for underprivileged kids in Marana, for Marana and Amphi School District. And, you know, this goes back uh, probably four years when God really just kind of put it on our heart. We didn't know where it was going to go for sure, but just uh, we realized that there were kids right here in our local community that really had some needs, specifically with shoes, with athletic shoes. And we just felt like God was putting on, on our heart to help kids in our local community and that it would start with this, collecting shoes, finding ways to get it to kids who really need them. And uh, God has done some amazing things uh, through this. And God has used you to help out kids in the most beautiful uh, ways through Moran and Amphi School District. And so this year, I want to put out a goal for us because I think the need is there. And I think we can meet this goal. And that is to bring in 2,000 pairs of shoes. And if we do that, I think we will meet a need in just... We bless our community in profound ways. Now, um, you'll notice on the card what we need. Is there are specific shoe size ranges that we need shoes uh, more of than maybe uh, some other ranges of shoes. So you can uh, look at that. And the other goal with this would be to have 100% participation from everyone who is able. Okay, Not to just have this be a thing where a few people end up doing all the shoes. Uh, or a bunch of them, let's all be a part of blessing our community and blessing these kids, because this is something that I think God has pulled us into. And while we do that, we can have some fun with it, and we can raise awareness for it. So if you enjoy kickball, uh, seriously, sign up. We're going to have a real kickball uh, tournament. It's going to be, a, and you know, get into it. Get, get your costume, get your outfit, pull it out from your college days, your high school days, and uh, have some fun with that as we do something profoundly good for the kids in our local community. Now, uh, today we begin a new series uh, called Identity, and as you look throughout Scripture, you will notice again and again, there is this emphasis on Scripture trying to help us to understand 
who we are in God, who he's created us to be, but who he's called us to be. And it's interesting when you look through scripture and you see this emphasis on this, you come to understand that there's something very powerful when we can come to truly understand our identity in Christ. And so this series is actually built out of a single passage out of uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, where it goes over these four very important qualities of our identity. It talks about the fact that we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and that we are his possessions. And every one of those things that Peter uses points to something very deep in our identity. And we believe this, and it's part of the reason that we're doing this series. The more we can come to understand who we are, the less we have to worry about what we're supposed to be doing. So as we kick off this series, we're going to begin this morning's message actually with a song that begins to set the tone for understanding how God has chosen us. We come to him to understand who we are.
Every human being knows what it is to lose their way. I mean, not just here in this place, all around the world. This, this, it's a part of what it means to be a person. At some point in time, I promise you this, if it hasn't happened already, at some point it will, you will find yourself standing in a place wondering how you got there. You'll find yourself standing in a place wondering how you ended up here, what happened, and, and even more than that, the questions you're going to ask are, okay, well, what do I do now, and, and what does this mean, and then beyond that, how do I find my way back? We all know what it is to lose our way. For some of us, we've actually experienced this in a you know, physical way. Life has actually changed. Maybe some of you in here have been through a divorce, marriage ended, and suddenly you're moving into an apartment, living in a new house, and you're trying to start this life kind of over. It's the life that you've been working towards, living towards, dreaming towards for much of life that suddenly just kind of got away from you in the way that it seems. And now here you are, and you find yourself wondering, how did I get here? What do I do? What does this mean? How do I find my way back? For some of you, it might be that you went off to school and you actually physically left, or you, you moved out for a job, you just moved away in general, and you thought you were going to go start a brave new world, a brave new life type of a thing, and you got there, and things didn't work out quite the way you planned, and accidents happened, and things occurred, circumstances beyond your control, and you failed, and you found yourself wondering, well, now what? It's like you lost your way. How do you find your way back? For some of us, it's not that it's physical. It's not that we moved somewhere out there. It's that we moved somewhere in here. Something inside of us moved. At some point in time, I know that some of you found yourselves in a spot where you, you did something you never thought you'd do. You chose something you never thought you'd choose. And upon choosing it, it felt like something inside of you broke. Like you fractured and though your world didn't change, everything around you was still the same. Suddenly it was like everything had changed. And you find yourself in that spot wondering, what am I supposed to do? How did I get here? How do I find my way back? You feel like you've lost your way. And you know, for some of us, it's not that you chose something. It's not that you went somewhere. It's what you didn't choose. For some of us, each day, we kind of wake up and we just, well, do the same thing we did yesterday. And the day before that. And every day just kind of folds into the next. And it's like we're living this life, but we forgot to actually live it. And we forget what it's like to be passionate. And we forget that there's a part of us that actually dreams. And we forget that there's, there's an excitement for life. Because life truly is a precious gift. In the way we would describe it is it's like, well, we've just become a little bit numb. Like life got zapped. And it feels like you've lost your way. Every human being knows what it is to lose their way. I think that's why those words, come to me, have such power to resonate with us. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at a book in the Bible, uh, 1 Peter. And we're going to look at a group of people that he writes this thing to. And they're a group of people that know what it is to lose their way. They're a group of people that understand uh, what it is to face life and have life throw them around a little bit. And to end up in a spot where they're asking questions like, how did I get here? And what do I do now? And above all, how do I find my way back home? And this series is called Identity. I hope it becomes a source of great encouragement for you. Um, and so as we look at that, I want to I wanna first kind of point to, in First Peter, and give you a little bit of context. You see, what makes Peter's book so powerful is not just the words that he writes, but it's the audience he writes these words to. Because you have to understand what's going to be happening in this, if you're going to understand what's going on over the course of the next four weeks here, especially for this morning. You see, Peter is writing to a group of Christians uh, that he refers to as, and, and historically are referred to as the Diaspora. And what that means, that word quite literally means the dispersed, the scattered, those in exile. And here's what happened. This is a time in history when Christianity was under this immense kind of persecution. And so people were forced to flee from their homes. People who were fine one minute weren't the next. They watched family members be taken away. They watched people get arrested. And so everybody kind of just scattered and dispersed. This last week I was driving on the campus here. And as I turned the corner, there was a covey of quail just kind of sprinting across the road. And all of a sudden, my truck is just in direct line with them, and you see what you always see when you see birds like that. Some of them just immediately start flying, and just for safety's sake, because now it's danger, we need to go fly their way to the other side. And the others kind of like scatter off back where they came from. One of them went forward, went back, flew, and flew straight to my car. I don't think it worked out well. 
in a weird way. That's what's happened to Christians in this first century church here, in this scattered out Asia Minor that, that Peter writes to. This is the diaspora, this is the dispersed. They face persecution. I've mentioned this before, but it, it's mentioning it again. Here's what was happening. There was a really wicked man who was an emperor of Rome. So this is the guy who was in charge. He has a ton of power and his name is Nero. And Nero is a monster. And you can think that that's a horrible thing to say, but allow me to illustrate how this plays out. Nero would, would take Christians and he would either arrest them, imprison them. Sometimes he would take them and sew them up into, have them sewn up in animal skins, like a pouch, and then placed in the middle of the Colosseum where they would release starving lions upon them. While, and, and these Christians would be devoured uh, while, to the sound of applause and cheers from the crowd in the Colosseum. It was kind of a horrendous moment. And so in 1 Peter, when he writes this phrase a little bit later, beware your adversary, the devil prowls about like a roaring lion seeking to devour you. We hear that and we're like, wow, that's powerful language. They would have heard this. They would have read this and understood exactly what he meant. This was very real. Nero used to take Christians and he would dip them in oil and then suspend them in the air in his gardens. And at nighttime, he would light them ablaze and he would use that as torchlight to host lavish dinner parties and garden parties. And people would find themselves socializing and entertaining to the torchlight of a burning Christian. Like, this was persecution in a very crazy, foul way. And so these people run and they flee. And they're scattered all about it. It's in this context, it's in this era that Peter writes this letter. And he does so to encourage them. See, this is what you have to understand. What makes Peter's words, what makes this book so powerful it is not just what he says, but who he says them to. Throughout all of 1 Peter, he continually encourages this group of believers that are dispersed, that are scattered, that are in exile, that are suffering, that know what it is to lose their way, that know what it is to have hardship, that know what it is to be confused. He continually encourages encourages them, not necessarily by saying, so here's what you need to do right now, but he's continually pointing them back to who they are and saying, remember this. And that matters so much. And you know this, or at least I hope you come to, because life around us changes, doesn't it? Our circumstances, they change. The things we do, they change. The stuff we have, it changes. But through it all, what doesn't change in this life is who God has made you to be. The one thing that remains constant is everything is, is fluxing and moving and, and fading away and coming anew. The one thing that never changes is you, who you truly are, who God has made you to be. No matter where you go, think of how encouraging it is for these people to hear this. Yes, it's dark. Yes, it's hard. Yes, you're scattered. Yes, you've lost your way. And yet, remember who you are. It's identity. See, identity is deeper than the truth of what's around us. Identity is the truth of what's within us, of what's true of us. It is who we are. And I find it to be so incredibly significant for even us right now. Because we're always worried about what to do and, and what's this world look like and what are we going to do with it and all this type of stuff. And the reality is, maybe if we spent more time telling people who they are, we could spend less time telling people what to do. Because when you've lost your way, the first step in finding your way back, the first step in opening your eyes to the direction and the purpose and the strength and the courage before you is when you come to remember who you are. There's one really significant verse in First Peter that is, uh, I would argue, is uh, profoundly significant and that I think there is no greater statement of identity in the entire book. And it's just one small verse. In fact, we are going to be focusing on this verse over the course of the next four weeks. And that verse is First Peter 2.9. So uh, if you want to turn your Bible there, let's read it together. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let me read it again. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
There are four bold statements of identity contained in this one verse. And each week what we're going to do is focus on just one of those and unpack what it means and what this means for us. Those four statements, uh, I heard Glenn mention them a little earlier, I'll mention them again. Number one, you are a chosen race. Number two, you are a royal priesthood. Number three, you are a holy nation. And number four, you are a people for God's own possession. And so today, as we kind of dig into this series called Identity, uh, we're going to start with the very first one and spend the rest of the, the remainder of the morning on it. And that is this, you are a chosen race. I'm going to say it again, you are a chosen race. Now Peter writes this, he writes this statement to encourage these people, to center these, these people of the diaspora who are dispersed, who are scattered, who are all over the place, uh, and to basically say, remember who you are. You are a chosen race. And he does this out of encouragement. And I want this room to be a place of encouragement this morning. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn to the person next to you. I want you to look at them and just say this, much like Peter says to all of us, you are a chosen race. It's a beautiful statement, right? Except, that's exactly how culture started. It's true, like in a weird way, congratulations, like first step in starting a cult. And that's the way that we would think about it. I'm serious, so if, if anybody were to walk up to you in our current context and be like, by the way, because remember, Peter's not just saying this, that you are a chosen race. What, what he is saying is that is true of you. So what I should have had you do is turn to the person next to you and look at them and go, I am a chosen race. Some of you would have choked on your words. You wouldn't have been able to say that with a straight face. Some of you would have done it just because, well, you're obedient and rule-following and, and you'd have gotten it out. But in the end, you'd be like, this is getting strange. Because I think we should, should just do the honesty thing of acknowledging it's a little bit of an awkward phrase, is it not? You are a chosen race? Because if you hear the phrase, you are a chosen race in our current context, the first thing that most people think of is what? The Aryan race. We think of Nazism. When we hear phrases like, you are a chosen race, we think of horrible atrocities. We think of things like genocide in Rwanda. We think of things like genocide in the Sudan and horrible things that, that happen. We think of one race elevating themselves above another race, thereby diminishing other people and committing horrible atrocities that spurn from hatred and aggression and all kinds of insecurity that flows from that whole paradigm. We would, like, usually in our current context, when we hear the phrase, you are a chosen race, it is, not, it is not the first step in finding your way back home. Rather, it becomes the first step of many steps in losing your way. And in the end, there's hatred and judgment and destruction, even when it's like genocide. And yet, this is what Peter says. So why did he say them? Why is this his message for that church? And in fact, I would argue, why is this his message for you and I even today? What is it that he means? What does this mean for us? And as we dive into that, as we look at that, what you have to understand is that he's actually making reference back to Genesis chapter 12, to a man named Abraham. If you turn to Genesis chapter 12, we encounter for the very first time in scripture uh, a man named Abraham, or rather we have our first interaction with him. We encounter him at the end of Genesis chapter 11. And at this point in the narrative, all that the author of Genesis has chosen to tell us about this man named Abram, whom we have come to know as Abraham, and your Bible uh, probably says Abram right now, uh, where you read it. The only thing that that author considers to be relevant to tell us is essentially this, that Abram has a family, that his father died, that he has a wife named Sarah who is unable to conceive children. They, were, they never had children. The Bible uses the word, says she was barren, unable to conceive children. Uh, and, that, and, and that's really all we know. And then we encounter him. That's apparently all the author thinks we need to know as we now encounter this deeply significant moment in Genesis chapter 12 where God actually goes and speaks to Abraham. God reveals himself to Abram and says, like, essentially, here is what I have for you. I want to meet you. I want to know you. And I have something for you. And so let's read that. Genesis chapter 12, starting at verse 1. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is the beginning of a relationship that gets further, so this promise gets further solidified in a covenant in Genesis chapter 15. 
And it's essentially God going to Abraham and he's saying, I choose you. I choose you to come to me. He goes to Abraham and says, I have a land that I want to take you to. I want you to leave the land that you're in. I want you to leave your father's land because I want to take you somewhere. Abraham, I choose you. I have something I want to show you, something I want to do for you and with you. And so he says essentially this, I want to give you a land to call your home. And I want to make you into a great nation, into a nation of people that you will have descendants. And I want to bless you, Abraham. I choose you and your descendants thereby. You see, Abraham was the father of a chosen race. Now here, that's what's conveyed. Now here's what's, what's really interesting is that, that idea of what's conveyed here is, is so beautiful, but for us in our current context is also really potentially dangerous as we seek to understand that and take that in. And the reason why is because we tend to get sideways when it comes to this idea of being chosen. We tend to miss the point. See, when it comes to being chosen, we have a tendency to focus on the idea of being chosen and miss what it is that we are actually chosen for. What many of us want to do in this moment, uh, whether it's with Abraham ourselves or anybody else as we think of this idea, is, is to elevate Abraham and to say, God chose Abraham and made because he was, he was above the others. He was better. He was superior than other races. God took him and said, I'm going to lower other races. I'm going to raise you up and you are going to be a superior type of race. And, and we, we have a tendency to do this because when we hear the word chosen, we have these thoughts of us standing behind a backstop waiting to get picked for a team. And there's so much value in it that we forget the fact. That the only reason we were standing by a backstop is because there was a sport to be played. We, when it comes to being chosen, we tend to focus on, on ourselves being chosen and miss what it is we're chosen for. And when we do that, bad stuff happens. Brokenness happens. When I was at the end of high school, I worked at a grocery store. I was what was called as courtesy clerk. It's what many of you who've never worked at a grocery store refer to as a bagger. The guy who bags your groceries, pushes carts, and I clean floors. So I, on a regular basis. It was a lot of exciting, a lot of fun. Uh, and, and did this. And so there are all these days where you'd be really busy and you're just bagging groceries as fast as you can. And on one of these particular days, my manager looks at the, the person next to me who's also a courtesy clerk. He works there. His name is Matt. And my manager says, hey, Matt, I have a special job I want you to help me with, a special project I want you to help me with. Uh, and so I need you to follow me. And so Matt just kind of drops what he's doing and says, sure, and walks off. And the rest of us are just kind of bagging faster because now we get a cover from Matt. And he comes back, and that says nothing about what he did. Apparently, he just did the project, finished it, and he comes back, and everything's fine. A few days later, again, we're kind of busy, not as busy as the first time, but again, you know, we're all up there. And, and my manager looks at Matt and says, Hey, Matt, I got another special project for you that I need your help with. Can you take care of it? And Matt just says, Sure, I'll do that. And he walks off and goes and takes care of it. At this point in time, because all of us are up there bagging. And here's the thing if you're bagging groceries for like hours on end, you just kind of want to do anything else. You know what I mean? Like anything else. You're just, and so this idea, all of us as courtesy clerks, all of us backers kind of look at each other. And he's like, hey, Matt, I have a special project. And we all just kind of glare and roll our eyes and just glare at Matt as he walks off in the other direction. This happens a little one more time a little bit later. And, and again, my manager looks and says, hey, Matt, I have a special project that I need your help with. Now, here's the thing. I'm kind of vocal. <laughs> and so I turn to my manager in that moment, and I shouldn't have. I'm in the front of the store, there's customers around, and I go, man, what is Matt your favorite? Why are you always choosing Matt for these special projects while the rest of us are up here bagging groceries? And I mean, I should have been like punished, suspended, talked to, something should have happened, because you know, you don't do that in front of the store, in front of customers and things. My manager instead just smiles, and he goes, Matt, take Ryan with you to do the special project. Make sure he's the one who does it. And then we walk off. We walk across the front of the store and we walk directly into the men's bathroom. <laughs> and we walk to one of the stalls. And in the stall is a clogged toilet that was filled with muck and destruction. Like, it shouldn't have been something to be fixed. It should have been something to be burned, quarantined, and demolished and rebuilt. <laughs> like, it was a horrible, horrible thing. I'm not going to go too much further into that. I think you understand. And Matt goes, well, here you go. And he's holding an industrial grade plunger and he hands the thing to me. He's like, have at it. There's this special project. And suddenly I realize why Matt has not been allowed to talk about the special project in front of the store. And so I dig the plunger in there and I start plunging this thing as many of us have done at some point in time. And I pull it out and nothing happens. It's still a mock mess and disgusting and I'm gagging and it's horrible. 
And, and Matt goes, I think you need more suction, like on that thing. You gotta get the plunger in there better. And this is like this really crazy plunger thing. So I, I jam it in there and I plunge like crazy on this toilet. And now I have a problem because I plunge this thing so much that it is sucked on there and I can't pull it off. And I start trying to pull it and I can't. I'm fighting with it as hard as I can. And Matt says, let me have a try. And so he grabs it and he starts trying to pull on it either. And he can't do it either. Now I'm an innovator, so I get an idea. I think to myself, you know what, I, I, my legs are stronger than my arms. So I stand up on the toilet with one foot on each side, and I stand over the top of it, and I just go, all right, count of three, you ready? And I go, one, two, three, and I pull with all my might, and lo and behold, I got it out. All of it. And it just, like a wall of, I was gonna say water, it's not. Like, hits me in the chest, and it bounces on, it sprays mad, it's on the walls, it's everywhere, and I'm standing there like, are you kidding me? You know it's a really bad day when you walk out of the bathroom and someone's like, man, you spilled coffee all over you, and you go, I wish. <laughs> There's some things you don't want to be chosen for. <laughs> Here's the truth of the matter. We get hung up on this idea of being chosen, but the truth of the matter is, it's not being chosen that is truly significant. It is what you are chosen for. It is not being chosen that is truly significant, but what you are chosen for. What was Abraham chosen for? Let's go back to the text. Let's read those verses again. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you. I will curse and you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. But he said, I will make of you a great nation, I will bless you, make your name great, comma, why? So that you will be a blessing. And I'm going to bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. It's not just that you're chosen, it's what you are chosen for. Abram, God comes to him and says, I have a plan, and what I'm choosing, friend, is the world. And to start with, I choose you. And I'm going to bless you in such a way that through you, the entire world is going to be blessed. Because there are larger things at stake here. I want you to be a part of it. He's not saying, Abram, you are superior. Abram, you are better than any other race. Think of this. He says, I will make of you a great nation. You're going to have a lot of descendants. You're going to have a, you're a chosen race, so to speak. You, you know who you don't choose for that job? You know who is not your first round draft pick for that role? is a 75-year-old man whose wife has been unable to have kids. Usually that is not your first pick for starting a great nation. That later we're told is as numerous as the stars in the sky. This isn't about elevating Abraham. It is what he is chosen for. I'm going to bless you that you might be a blessing. You know what happens? 2,000 years after Abraham. Of that chosen race, a child of Abraham is born, and his name is Jesus. And he was the Son of God, and yet fully man, born among us. And he was a chosen race, and a chosen person. And you say, well, chosen for what? Because that's what matters, right? And it wasn't he wasn't chosen to elevate himself above all others. He said crazy things like, in the kingdom of God, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. He who seeks to save his life will lose it. He who seeks to lose his life will save it. He essentially says, I came here to serve. There are times where this person, this Jesus, is kneeling at people's feet, washing them like a servant. Because when you are a blessed to be a blessing, when you bless somebody else, you lift them up. You raise them up. And so Jesus, he sees a world that is just yearning for an unconditional kind of love. Because all we ever experience is conditions. And if we don't live up to those things, it just seems like there's not love to be had. And he sees this world and says, but I have unconditional love that I can give you. And it's a world that's yearning for grace. And it's a world that yearns for joy. And he steps down into the middle of it. And, and he didn't rise to a throne and put himself above everybody else and make a bunch of laws. No, he was blessed to be a blessing to the world. And what he did was he encountered the marginalized and he encountered those cast aside. And rather than cast them aside like everybody else, he himself became marginalized. He himself became cast aside. And rather than look at the world 
and much like we see with the Aryan race, much like we see with Nazism and genocide and all the things today, he didn't seek to put others to death, but rather saw the worth and value of a human being in a world that longed for love, and he sought to save it. And so he said, not that you should die, but that he might. And he bled, and was killed, and he gave his life. So that there might be forgiveness and newness of life for the world that longed for it. That he might bless this world. You see, it's not just that you're chosen that matters. It's what you're chosen for. You say, okay, I got it. What does that have to do with me? I, I'm not a child of Abraham and I'm not Jesus. Like, what does this have to do with me? Well, here's a really interesting moment that occurs. There's a moment where Jesus is uh, sitting in a room with his followers kind of all around him. His mom and his brothers uh, all come up and they're outside and, and they essentially get a messenger and say, can you go tell Jesus we'd like to talk with him? And the messenger comes into Jesus and he says, hey, your mom and your brothers are outside. And Jesus looks at him and he says, Much, he does exactly what I'll do with you who are followers in Christ right now. He gestures to the followers of, of him in the room and he says, these are my brothers. These are my sisters. These are my family. And he says, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven, they are my brothers, my sisters, my mothers. If you are a follower of Jesus, welcome to the family. You're a part of the family. Furthermore, he died upon a cross and we, much like what you just did in communion before, we uh, celebrate the blood that he shed. There is a part of us that each of us in this room know what it is to share in his blood. Welcome to the family. Friends, you are a chosen race. You are a people with a purpose. And that is profound. <laughs> Because even now, for those of you who have lost your way, even now, for those of you who are trying to find your way back, you still, no matter where you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what kind of situation you're in, no matter the confusion in your heart, no matter the lack of that, or, uh, direction in front of you, there is something that you have, and it's your identity. It is that you are a chosen race. You are a part of a chosen race, which means it's not just that you're chosen, but rather what you are chosen for, which means you are never without purpose. That even in your confusion, even in your lack of clarity, even when you don't know what to do, there is something still, even in that moment, that you have. And it's this, you know what it is to be blessed by the unconditional love and grace and power and beauty of the God of the universe. And it means that wherever you are, you are still in this world, and there is a world that longs to be blessed by it. And by the way, you're created for it. John chapter 20, verse 21 he, they, Jesus has died. The disciples are freaking out because they've been following him around and they don't know that he's going to rise again. And they've locked themselves in a room because Jesus was brutally murdered and they're worried as his followers if they're now going to face the end of their life and what to do. They've locked themselves away. And Jesus rises again and none of them know and he suddenly appears there in the middle of the room. Can you imagine the freak out moment that would be in a locked room? And they don't believe it. They figure it out. And there he is standing in the flesh. And you know what he says to him, to them in this exchange? Because what's got to be going through their heads is, oh my gosh, he's alive now. What? Jesus looks at them. And he says, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, even so I am sending you. You are chosen. You are a chosen race, which means you have a purpose. That which Jesus came for, it's yours. You are blessed to be a blessing. And there is a world longing to be blessed. You are a part of the family of God. And your circumstances can't change that. And your lack of direction can't change that. And your failures can't change that. And your frustrations can't change that. It is who you are. It remains. So friends, remember who you are. Discover your identity. And allow it to live through you. And pour it out of you. Because there's a world out there filled with people waiting to be called family. They just don't know that they're right. See, the honest truth of it. You are a chosen race. 
Not that you would lift yourselves up and elevate yourselves, but that you, just like Jesus, might raise others up. You have been blessed to be a blessing. In your lives, I promise you, in your workplaces, even if you're in a job that you hate, even if you're in a job that every single day is just droning on, do you know what is with you in that job? Opportunities to interact and experience other human beings. And you have a deeper purpose than your job, a deeper purpose than simply waking up in the morning, don't you? Why? Because you are a chosen race. So may it flow out of you, may it live out of you, may it change things. If you're in friendships if, that you're having a hard time with, you're like, I just don't know how to act and I don't know what to do. You have this. You always have this purpose. You are blessed to be a blessing. Show love, show grace, allow that to flow out of you, not because you ought to. It is who you are, just in the honesty of who you are, open your heart and let people see. And when you find yourself so far gone because of decisions and things that you made that you feel like you can't find your way back, I just want you to know Jesus is with you. Truth be told, you never left home. And yet there's a world out there wanting to find their way back home and you have it with you. And you be the invitation they long for. And you be a person in this world because of who you are it is proudly welcoming people into the family. Just like you want to Because as human beings, we all know what it is to lose our way. Perhaps that's why those words come to me are beautiful, even still.
ask for you and embrace the family that he calls us to be. If you are new here, we'd love to meet you in the 10 minute party. If you are looking to get connected or get more information about everything that goes on around here, we have the info center in the lobby. Have a wonderful Sunday.